from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead today out of Iowa State University, Lee Schultz with this week's cattle market segment. Lee will remark on the agricultural trade agreement with China, what that means to the cattle trade. And Lee talks about cost management in cattle production and why shooting for the absolute lowest cost possible may not be the best approach. Then from the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, the panel takes up the topic of converting from cow-calf production to a calf backgrounding operation. Further ahead, this week's 4-H segment, Jeff Wickman talks with K-State's Wade Weber about the success of new 4-H program initiatives started this past year. That and more coming up on this Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is the K-State Radio Network, and welcome once more to Agriculture Today. For our cattle market segment, we welcome in once more via phone livestock economist Lee Schultz of Iowa State University. Of course, we'll take up the newly announced trade agreement with China, at least in principle. And a little later on, we'll discuss cost management in cattle production and why shooting for the absolute lowest cost structure each and every time out may not be in the best interest of the producer. More on that later. Looking back at this last week's trade, though, Lee, again, a fairly quiet scene, nothing really shaking in a major way there. Then that was the case, really. The void of any lack of, of information early in the week pretty much just had, had the market trading sideways. Friday was a bit of a surprise when futures screens really turned green um, in reaction to at least the agreement in principle with China and and help put markets over uh, a week ago levels. You know, I I think we're really trading in positive fundamentals, though. I think cash markets continue to be rather strong. We see feeder cattle markets really strong this last week, I think kind of on the last run of, of feeder cattle for 2019. So I think fundamentals are really there to possibly push us over 120 on the cash market for live cattle as we close out 2019. Which would be a great way to finish this calendar year. Since you bring it up, and of course everybody, it seems, has weighed in on what that Phase 1 trade agreement with China may mean to production agriculture. So as per the cattle trade, what is your take on that, Lee? Well, I think first and foremost, you got to break apart kind of the, the impact versus the sentiment. And from the initial standpoint of, of really at least making some movement after this contentious 18-month trade war, we've certainly added a, a positive sentiment to the market. And, and that's really reflective in what futures markets did on Friday. And I, I continue those. I think I would expect those to be supportive as we get a little bit more news and, and if the news is positive from the, this trade agreement. Now, when it reacts to beef, I I think you need to really temper that a bit um, because realizing China isn't a major uh, market for U.S. beef or it hasn't traditionally been been a major market for U.S. beef. But I think it could help, one, at least stocks domestically, um, as we really expect uh, increase in pork exports and, and broiler exports that could ease protein stocks domestically and be supportive for the beef market. And although when we look at at the deal with China and, you know, many news articles note that it could bring purchases nearly over $15 in in 2020 and 2021, I I think that's a two-year average, but we still don't have many specifics on that. China will likely have to buy some beef to really reach that level, especially if if a lot of this is targeted ag products uh, and and beef being really at the top of the value there. uh, That's going to have to get some increase in, in beef exports, which should be positive overall to the beef market. 
but there are tons of variables that could sway either direction for just about every commodity, actually. The details of the agreement and how they actually flesh out and manifest themselves in actual trade, well, that's what will make the difference in the market. That's exactly the case, and I I really kind of point to a a few things that that have come out uh, in many of the news reports. It's still unclear how the U.S. will roll back tariffs uh, that are currently in place, and with this phase one deal, China has really maintained firmly that 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 will be the case, that we'll roll back some of those tariffs that, that were in place, not fully rolling back some of those, but understanding how that shakes out um, and impacts trade will, will be very important. And then I think we haven't really seen the, this in writing yet, so we don't really know the, the devil in the details, right? And so we really can't make all that many forecasts going forward until we fully understand what is in place as far as the deal. Well, it'll be monitored very closely as hopefully more details come to the surface here in the days and weeks ahead on that China Phase 1 trade agreement with the United States. Quick look here, if we might, Lee, on a subject that you have been tracking closely, call cow prices and uh, the marketing opportunities for those who are calling cows, or do they want to retain those and keep them on feed for an improved marketing opportunity? What do you have to share with us? Well, I think this is going to be one year that um, there may be a value proposition to add some weight to those cows, get some white fat on those cows, and market them into a seasonally higher price. Now, historically, we've really seen the the market low for cold cow prices as we get into November and and December, and that's looking to be the, the case this year, as that's where the largest supply of cold cows is on the market. We have to go back to really 2016 fall and into 2017 of the spring to really show a time that 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 was a no-brainer to hold on to those cows and market them um, into the new year, which was 2017. If we look back the last two years, that really hasn't been the case. We've really seen pretty flat cold cow prices, and really the, the cost of holding those cows wasn't benefited by higher prices. As we look here ending 2019 and into 2020, I think collectively there's a lot of factors pointing to the fact that we'll likely see higher cold cow prices into 2020, and we have relatively low feed costs and available forage supplies. Um, as we looked at, harvested forage is, is much larger than, than year-ago levels, really pointing the opportunity to add weight and value to those cows. I think that the biggest factor driving that is the positive Feedlot margins, as we look into 2020, that's very correlated with helping support those cold cow prices. And really, I think, could be beneficial to the cow man that um, is looking to you know, market cows when we didn't see calf prices all that strong last year. Um, this is just another way to add value to that cow-calf operation. As always is the case, put a pencil to it, producers, but something to look at closely as far as your cold cow management. Now to some thoughts that you expressed, Lee, in a recent article. You talked about cost management and how that figures into profitability and maybe are trying to dispel some thoughts that some folks have about minimizing their costs. You might explain. Sure, and this article is available on, on the Waltz's Farmer magazine, which, which is available online. Um, and, and I think really the, the point of this article uh, was just to really talk about, we always talk about be a low-cost producer, but, but that's maybe not necessarily um, the best case for every producer. And maybe think about being the best manager of costs and a better marketer of your products. And so really looking at that input-output relationship And the fact that maybe you need to spend a little bit more money and increase expenses, but that'll increase the value of your product. A couple examples are winter feeding of beef cows and how that impacts uh, the value or the pounds of feeder calf that you'll have to sell in that that next turn of sales. Another good example is preconditioning of calves. So we know that preconditioning, there's often a premium for those calves that are marketed, but also there's a cost to that. Um, And so understanding that, you know, if I'm going to incur a a higher cost, is there value there and does that increase my profits? So what you're coming around to said succinctly is producers on more than one occasion need to spend money to make money in achieving that target of profitability. Uh, 
Effectively, yes, that's the case. The only caution I would have is there is a diminishing returns when we talk about adding additional inputs or, or incurring additional expenses. And so understanding that you know each additional input or, or cost will give you an additional output. Um, and so realizing that just because you're spending money doesn't mean you're, you're going to make money. So th- that's a really important balance to look at year over year. Um, and I really go back to the age old saying that you can't manage what you don't measure. And so I think the first step for many producers is just to understand your cost structure and your value structure so that you can make decisions year in and year out um, and balance those, those costs and returns. Lastly here, Lee, we have a cattle on feed report coming up from the USDA this Friday, the 20th of December, just ahead of the holidays. Any thoughts on what those numbers might tell us? Well, I think uh, first you have to look at there was um, one less slaughter day or one less placement day or business day as we look at it. So that, that's going to certainly impact some of those numbers. Um, you know, I, I expect placement numbers um, are probably going to be close to, to year-ago levels. But, but there's certainly going to be a wide range on there, as we've seen with pre-report expectations. Cattle on feed numbers, you know, again, I think we could see it push about near year-ago levels, but there could be a, a bit of range um, on that. You know, I think we haven't got a, a lot of great evidence from uh, when you look at feeder cattle markets um, on the number of receipts. That's really been uh, pretty volatile just given the, the fall that we've had with a late harvest. So that's made it a little bit more difficult to, to kind of understand what some of these numbers are for the cattle on feed report. Uh, I think, you know, we're going to see markets here pretty supported as we close out the year. One thing I'm really looking at is we have these the two national holidays, Christmas and New Year's, on a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. That's really going to be a challenge to packers to manage inventories. And so I think they're going to be pretty aggressive here in the next couple of weeks to, to really manage um, those inventories. So I'm, I'm really looking at that as at slaughter levels as really a driving factor here the last couple of weeks, more than the inventories we're going to see in the cattle on feed report. The input appreciated, Lee, and we will talk again in a few weeks. Many thanks. Thank you. Lee Schultz, Livestock Economist with Iowa State University, with this week's cattle market segment, and you're tuned to Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. We're back with Agriculture Today. I'm Britton Rucker. Coming to you from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University is another BCI Cattle Chat. Participating in this week's podcast are veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson. Also joining them is a livestock economist Dustin Pendle and cow-calf specialist Bob Weber. Brad tells us here the topics they'll be focusing on this time around. On today's show, we're going to talk about getting into stalker cattle or making stalker cattle work on your operation, does it make sense or not? And talk some about treatment protocols. What's the best way to put that together? Because at that changing weather, we know we're treating some calves. So what are the things we should look for? So the the question actually was a listener from Indiana who is getting into stalker cattle. Uh, It's a family transition and moving basically from a cow-calf operation and he wants to do stalker cattle. But basically, it, it's, a, it's a good question, but it's a pretty difficult question. And his question was, well, how do I make a living running stalker cattle? And that's both a very simple answer and an extremely complex answer. This, the simple answer is, well, you're going to need to do a really good job on buying and selling. You're going to need to keep the animals healthy, and you're going to need to grow them on a, at a cost-effective rate of gain. Yeah. So that, that's the simple that's part of it. <laughs> the hard part is implementation of all that. Because <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. so, there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle. But, and I may talk just a little bit about, so transitioning from cow-calf to stalker, there are some 
pros and cons just in that process, right? Yes. So, so it's a different type of labor, and a, a different frequency a different, of labor. And a different kind of financing, too. And a different kind of financing. You know, the, the speed that money comes in and comes out and the, the magnitude. Well, one of the things that I talked to him about was, you know, he was really interested in some of the uh, resources that could come from universities and extension. And I provided him some links to what I think are some of the, the best sites. So I think, obviously, the, the Kansas State Ag Econ and Animal Science site as well as the sites out of uh, Nebraska and Iowa State and some others, I think, have really good, valuable information. But then I tried to point out some of the things we were talking about earlier about averages, that I think the university and Extension does a great job of kind of setting out what's, what's typical and what is a typically a good decision and those types of But you can't advice. go just off averages. But no, you can't. And that's what we talked about is yeah. develop that, that local knowledge. And so a local... Uh, someone that can help him locally uh, market and someone that can help him locally on the health side uh, and the nutrition side is going to be really important. So the university fills a great role of doing research, uh, providing kind of what's what's best in most situations or typical and ideal and those types of things. But then the, the actual management at that county or, or locality is going to have to have some local knowledge to really implement it well. And, and I think there are a lot of principles that come into, I mean, we talk about stocker cattle but livestock a lot of the similar principles when you're investing in something that should appreciate in value i mean so we've got all the health production components on the side but you're making a big investment and then you're going to be selling it later to either replace that investment or not so similar principles to some of the big financial management decisions you might make the other thing is i mean you may think outside the box are we talking about should I look at stalkers that are grazing corn stalks? Should I look at stalkers that are doing something different than maybe what everybody else is? Am I going to go year round? Am I just going to go with summer grazing? Great. Well, and one of the things you've talked about before, Bob, is that we can't just make a decision once, right? So this year I'm going to do it this way, and so then next year just fall into that same decision uh, yeah, process. I always evaluate the opportunities. Yeah, so you gotta you gotta look at what's available. What does the forage base look like this year? What are some of the market things? And then I like the idea of I really like asking somebody. Right? He asked you. You guys had a great conversation, and you you may not have answered every question, but you gave him some things to take in, and he can talk to some exactly. other people. So as we look at, you talked about the uh, straightforward approach: buy low, sell high. So so we know your purchase price is important. Yep. Your sale price is important. The other thing that you mentioned that I want to pick up on was our cost of gain, which could tie into value of gain. And we've had that discussion here before. And there's a podcast where we outline kind of the process of how you'd calculate that value of gain. But I want to talk a little bit about cost of gain because that's the easier one to look at, which mm-hmm. is essentially my total costs, feed costs being the big one, health costs, anything else, divided by how many pounds they gain. How do I try to manage that? Well, I think, again, it it sounds simple. You want a relatively low cost of gain, but then the implementation is is usually identifying feedstuffs that are going to be relatively inexpensive. But at the same time, I have to get the performance out of those feedstuffs. So again, it's not just, you know, it's not, I'm not just pricing feed on a per pound of feed basis. It's how much growth can I get from, again, in and, and different situations, I might uh, calculate it a, a slower rate of gain with a more forage-based diet because that's the cheapest cost of gain. Or it may be something with a little higher supplementation. And so it, it is really about getting out the calculator and looking at, so what is going to be my cost for the rate of gain? And, 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 coupled with, so the complexity comes in, I may want to do a higher rate of gain to make sure that I meet a marketing window before I go and say a period, you know, we have price seasonality and, yes. and, and feeders, um, particularly, you know, he's going to be able to potentially access a fair number of fall born calves. So managing those and getting them marketed at the appropriate times may necessitate either accelerating or decelerating rate of gain to, to hit the, to get the market window. Market. And yep, exactly. Yeah, so it's so it, lots of moving pieces. But you guys hit my point is it's not just feed cost. Right. It's also the rate of gain that influences that cost of gain because you've got yeah. that maintenance every yeah. day. So you don't want to be too low. You want to get enough gain there. As we talk about having profit, one of the things we got to we got to manage health, not just on the stocker operation, but even on the cow calf. This is a time of year that that we may be treating calves. We may have calves, and and I want to think about we think about respiratory disease in calves. 
But there are other things, too, that we encounter with those calves as they go through. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of having a treatment protocol. So, Bob, I'm going to turn to you, and I'm going to say, if, if I'm putting together a treatment protocol, I'm working with my veterinarian, what are some of the considerations that I might have that I might want to include in that protocol? Well, there's a lot of important things to consider. First of all is, what diseases am I looking at? And then again, a couple of real common ones would be to have a protocol for respiratory disease. You might also have a, a protocol for a foot rot or some other things that you're going to run into. And I'm, the veterinarian is going to help you select a drug based on, you know, experience with how successful that is. So, you know, is this antibiotic a good match for the bacteria that causes this particular disease? Because there's some differences. So some antibiotics work better on certain types of bacteria than others. So that's going to be the first part of the decision. Um, treatment frequency. There are some products that you need to give every day, others that have multi-day extended duration. So that's going to impact uh, the decision. And then other things such as even just syringability and ease of giving the product. So those become kind of first, and cost, I should add. So those become kind of the first line decision. And then usually you have a secondary, a second line, if an animal doesn't respond to the first treatment, a second treatment that would be different or hit, hit the bug from a different direction is often what we look at. Now, so you want a logical plan of first and second treatments based on a lot of things, including cost, but efficacy is really what's driving this. How effective do I think this product is going to be? And then one of the things that I think is important to think about is this is a protocol and so you'll want to treat it that way and stick with it and treat every animal the same so that and one of the reasons we do that is so that we can evaluate is this particular protocol working so i'm going to balance that way that's key because our our memory is fallible and and we've talked about that before we remember stuff that didn't respond the way we thought it should Right, and having having the the records to go back to, and and you talk about second line. Well, part of the whole second line decision is, well, how many days post first treatment do I do I draw the line, and then what are what are the criteria for this one didn't respond to first line treatment that I actually need to implement? Because it might be that they responded and they just haven't completely recovered. Well, does that necessitate round two or not? And so having having a good discussion about well. How do I? Because you don't want to let them go too long, but you also don't want to incur um, additional costs, additional costs, and to. use antibiotics you don't need to use. And so that's to me always the gray spot. And that veterinarian input can be really helpful in delineating those decision points. But it, but you got to write that stuff yeah. down, and, and especially on those treatments. Because you which be calves to... did I treat? Which calves yes. did I not treat? And then how many responded? Because we will tend to overestimate the amount of if it had a negative response. So if I treated this calf and it died, overestimate the failures, whereas there might have been eight that I treated that did fine. So I don't necessarily need to change my treatment based Mm -hmm. on that. And and that's a reason to just keep some records. And again, the good thing in most of beef cattle production, the, the, the amount of records we need is not tremendous i mean it's just write some things down that you want to make the decisions key things, about yeah, yeah. Yeah. and that helps ties to our cost too absolutely uh you want to know what you, i mean a lot of your production records and also if you can keep some of those financial records will come back and at the end of the day can help quite a bit from the beef cattle institute at kansas state university that was brad white bob larson dustin pendle and bob weber be sure to hear the entire podcast at beefcattleinstitute.org Again, that is beefcattleinstitute.org. For Agriculture Today, I'm Britton Rucker. All right, Britton, thank you. Now we'll break away for a few moments, and when we come back, today's agricultural news headlines for you. Also, the latest tree tales from the Kansas Forest Service at K-State. And once more, Jeff Wickman is awaiting with this week's 4-H segment for you. All of that still ahead here on the K-State Radio Network and agriculture today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. For you now, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. And as was discussed earlier with Iowa State's Lee Schultz, China and the U.S. have reached that preliminary agreement on the first phase of a trade deal, including increased purchases of U.S. agricultural products, although the amount was not specified. The deal, which still needs to go through a legal review before it's signed into place, prevents a new round of tariffs from going into effect on Sunday. The 25% tariffs on approximately $250 billion worth of Chinese imports will remain, while a 15% tariff on $120 billion of imports will be cut in half to 7.5%. Chinese officials said the U.S. would remove tariffs in stages, but offered no further details. Here's more on the deal from the USDA's Rod Bain. Both the U.S. and China Friday confirmed what has been widely reported. The initial phase of a trade agreement between the two nations has been agreed upon. Back in February, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer told lawmakers, What we want is fair trade that requires structural change and it has to be enforceable. And via a USTR press release Friday, Ambassador Lighthizer said the agreement marks what he says is critical progress towards a more balanced trade relationship and a more level playing field. Part of the agreement includes Chinese commitments to purchase up to $50 billion in U.S. agricultural exports. Among those anxious for a return to China's market is Tim Atkinson of the National Sorghum Producers. Two years ago, it went from 80% of our U.S. sorghum crop went to China to basically zero. We can get that trade reopened at the level it was. We're still exporting our crop into China, but at a much lower level. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Now, while the president and others have previously said that China could commit to buying 40 to 50 billion dollars of U.S. agricultural products, the Chinese have balked at committing to a dollar figure, instead saying the purchases need to be based on their domestic demand. According to the South China Morning Post, which is often viewed as the source of official news from Beijing, China purchased $137 billion worth of agricultural goods from all origins last year. The The U.S. has never surpassed $30 billion of that total, coming closest back in 2012. Last year, U.S. sales totaled only $9.2 billion as the tariffs weighed on trade. Now, the wheat industry praised the news, among many others, saying they hoped an agreement would allow that industry to take advantage of beneficial revisions to the country's tariff rate quotas that were completed earlier this year. China agreed to expand its tariff rate quotas for wheat imports to 9.6 million metric tons. That would be significantly above the 1.6 million metric tons of wheat that the U.S. sold in China in 2016 and 17. Meantime, Mexico's Senate voted last week to approve the modifications to the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, known as the USMCA. The Senate vote of 107 to 1 there gave approval to increased enforcement of labor and environmental rules. That vote clears the way for a revamped version of the North American Free Trade Agreement to take effect, that is, after the U.S. and Canada ratify the modifications. Mexico is agreeing to establish dispute resolution panels to ensure that its workers can organize and demand better wages. Mexico has reformed its labor laws to guarantee secret ballot votes on union representation and contracts. Those new panels will aim at making sure those rules are enforced. And congratulations to the K-State Crops team as the dynasty continues. That team recently captured the title of national champions, winning the Kansas City American Royal Collegiate Crops Contest and the Chicago Collegiate Crops Contest. K-State teams have now won the Collegiate Crops Championship in 17 of the past 21 years. The uh, University of Wisconsin-Platteville second at both events, Iowa State third in Kansas City, Purdue was third in Chicago. Official members of the team, Blake Kirchhoff of Nebraska, Noah Winans of Michigan, and Nate Dick from Inman, Kansas. The alternate contestants, Madison Tunnel of Olathe, Alex Kaufman of Concordia, 
Evan Bott of Palmer, and Trevor Mullen of Salina. All are agronomy majors at K-State. And the team, of course, coached by K-State professor of agronomy, Kevin Donnelly. So again, the K-State crops team, again, national champions, 17 of the past 21 years, including here in 2019. Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Tree Tales. Here's K-State Forster, Bob Atchison. Bob? A total of $7 million is now available to Kansas farmers, ranchers, and landowners. And up to 90% of project costs can be covered to plant trees and improve woodlands. The Regional Conservation Partnership Program is delivered through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, otherwise known as EQIP and it's focused in high-priority watersheds in the eastern third of Kansas. The Kansas Forest Service at Kansas State University delivers the program through professional foresters that provide on-site visits to help landowners develop project plans. The goal of the program is to improve the overall health of Kansas watersheds above federal reservoirs that provide two-thirds of the water supply to the people of the state. These reservoirs are filling up with sediment from failing stream banks, and planting trees and caring for woodlands can help reduce erosion and, in the long term, the expensive cost to dredge these reservoirs. To qualify for the program, landowners must own property within an eligible watershed and have a resource concern such as stream bank erosion or woodlands in need of improvement. Program eligibility may be determined by contacting the Kansas Forest Service or your local Natural Resource Conservation Service office otherwise known as NRCS. Program information may also be obtained by contacting the Kansas Forest Service at 785-532-3300 or check us out on the web at www.kansasforest.org. Funding is awarded on a first-come, first-served basis. Applications are processed as they are received. Forestry contractors are also available to undertake projects from start to finish, and the majority of their costs are covered through the program. The program is designed to improve the overall value of a farm or ranch operation by reducing the loss of valuable farmland through tree planting and increasing the productivity and health of Kansas woodlands. This is Bob Atchison with the Kansas Forest Service at Kansas State University encouraging you to support the state of Kansas by participating in this important program. You've been listening to another Tree Tale. Thanks, Bob. Jeff Wickman and this week's 4-H segment is coming your way next on Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. 4-H is America's largest youth development organization, working with nearly 6 million people across the U.S. and over 74,000 in Kansas to help them develop the skills to be tomorrow's leaders. As 2019 comes to a close, Kansas 4-H program leader and 4-H youth development department head Wade Weber discusses the program and how it continues to develop new initiatives to meet the needs of today's youth. We had an opportunity to talk about some of the things that have been going on in 4-H over the last 12 months. There are a lot of programs that are offered, a lot of project areas. You really cover a lot of things that youth are not only interested in, but want to learn a lot more about and want to put into practice. And I think that's where 4-H really comes in as you give those youth the opportunity to put these skills into practice. Absolutely. We seek to employ each and every day that concept of learning by doing. It's as old as the extension model, really, which is how can we demonstrate this new and innovative or a concept that maybe is a little bit different than what we've experienced up until this point? How can we demonstrate that in a learning community? And then in that context of a learning community, which we oftentimes call the 4-H club, in that learning community, we get to demonstrate how we approach learning together. And it's in that moment uh, within a club as they're learning together, as they're making decisions together, as they're serving together, 
as they're demonstrating and encouraging each other to be excellent together. Really, it's that developmental context that provides that great experience that 4-H has been known for for a long time and will continue to be known for in putting those skills and demonstrating those skills within a context that's supportive, that we really talk about helping young people belong, that they have a place, that they have a role to play in their community. And I think that's such a key component that if we can encourage that development and that behavior within young people, that they're learning from each other, they're encouraging each other to deepen their learning, and then they're encouraging them to demonstrate or act upon what they've just learned in a way that benefits themselves in decision-making as well as benefits others around them. That's really going to be a key component of what we know and what we celebrate each and every year is the, the hallmarks of, of the Kansas 4-H experience in our communities. You mentioned the sparking the interest, and that's really, I think, one of the strengths of Kansas 4-H is the fact that you get youth who start at such a young age and they have a chance to learn as kind of through the elementary age and they go through maybe even that awkward teenage stage and they get to where they're almost adults in high school and the things that they can learn and the self-confidence that they can gain by being part of this organization. Absolutely. One of the geniuses of the 4-H program is really saying that how we approach and engage young people in a belonging context, a supportive context where, you know, when they're seven, eight, nine years old, you know, there's an opportunity for them to be invited into a smaller group of of individuals who are committed to to being there with them, to learning with them, to encouraging them. I mean, we all remember the day and age when we had a 16 year old, 18 year old, whatever, turn to us and say, you know, that's that's how something was really interesting. I learned something from you, and you're sitting there at eight years old going, what? <laughs> you know, this this high schooler said they learned something from me. I mean, they'll remember that for the rest of their lives, and I think that's what we celebrate. That 4-H creates that context and stewards that context for young people to really know that it's a safe environment for them to try something, to maybe fail at something, to demonstrate grit and resilience, you know, to try and pursue something, to realize that not everything you put your hand to the first time is going to instantaneously be successful, but yet encouraging that community context to encourage those young people to keep at it, to be, build that resilience, to keep after that uh, self-improvement along the way. And I think that's where project-based learning in the context of mentors and peers that ultimately we then showcase at things like fairs or in some of our contexts, like a school partnership. For instance, this last year, we had, had a great innovative partnership with our partners at Fort Riley, for instance, because they're you know shifted from one base to the next. Families move all during July, which is typically when the Gary County Fair is, for instance. And so we purposely created an alternative in partnership with the state office and the Gary County office to create a showcase opportunity at the end of May where we had ribbons and judging and feedback for those young people who are involved in the program. Why? Because the importance is not so much where we do it, but the point is we're trying to create those contexts where young people have the opportunity to receive that feedback from their peers as well as from caring adults who are saying, fantastic job. Now, continue to encourage you to keep getting better. So we're trying to always think about all the ways in which we can engage young people where they're at and help them be successful. Then we think about the other end of the spectrum to those young people who are in those teenage years who are thinking about what does it mean for me to be a leader, for me to be a contributor to my community? How can I, you know, developmentally, I'm starting to think a little bit beyond just my club, maybe a little bit even beyond my hometown as they get older. And so one of the beauties of that partnership, the local level, all the way to the state, and even to the international level with 4-H, is there's a way in which once you become familiar with the program at the local level, you fast forward, and all of a sudden that same name, the 4-H program, has a sense of affinity and connection that all of a sudden finds itself with each and every iteration as you get older and older and older. You see the circle expand further and further and further, you know, to the point where Kansas, for instance, has a longstanding history with the Japanese exchange program through 4-H. And it's a great way to help, again, expand their viewpoint of the world as well as ours. I mean, those types of things that I think are fascinating. I mean, just the stories I've heard about when children are born in Japan, they sign up for this trip to come to Kansas, you know, 14 to 16 years later, <laughs> you know, and you just think to yourself, whoa, <laughs> that there's so much value that they see in that partnership with Kansas 4-H that they'll literally sign their kids up 14 years in advance to be a part of that. 
we're talking about that kind of monumental experience and then to reciprocate that on the on the other side too so that as young people whether it's in state exchange trips and learn about how 4-H is embodied a little bit differently and in Maryland and Chesapeake Bay as it does in Puerto Rico as it does in Washington state and yet there's also that same similarity of like, how do we learn together? How do we make decisions together? How do we exercise generosity with one another? Teaching those senior 4-H members what it means to be caring and empathetic to somebody who's younger and to help them in the learning process. And when we talk about connecting with intentionality and with care, I think those are really great skills we want our high schoolers to learn. And the 4-H club gives us that context for that to happen. And at the same token, our partnership with K-State is an opportunity to continue to encourage those young people as they deepen their learning that K-State could be a viable option for them as they think about, like, you mean I could have a career in this? You know, not just an interest area, but, like, I could actually have a life that's contributing to my own self-betterment, but also the betterment of those around me. These are the types of community building things that we talk about in 4-H each and every year. And I'm so proud to be a part of this organization and so proud for all the thousands of volunteers who help make that a reality each and every year. That's State 4-H Program Leader and 4-H Youth Development Department Head Wade Weber. To learn more about becoming involved with 4-H as a club member or volunteer, go to kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.